All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, this is Eli Sagor in St. Paul. Very happy to have some IT help uh, for today's uh, webinar from uh, the University of Minnesota CFAN's IT department, Noah Holm. Um, uh, glad to have everyone here. Come on in. Welcome. Um, uh, this is the fifth, I guess, webinar in our series this uh, spring. We're very happy with Extension here to be working with the Sustainable Forest Education Cooperative, uh, who's based at the Cloquet Forestry Center. Um, and we're very happy to have everyone uh, with us today. Uh, the topic today is Minnesota phenology, monitoring seasonal change. This is a topic that we've been presenting on a lot uh, lately. We've had a number of workshops this spring. We've done some webinars. Rebecca Montgomery, Stephen Carlson, Chris Bajarski, uh, and I have all been talking about this topic and finding a lot of interest. Uh, for reasons that I'll be discussing as we go on. So I'm going to get into that in just a minute, but before I do, I want to mention uh, something. Some of you heard me say this before if you were here for the sound check. Um, any of you who are planning to request continuing education credits, um, the con we'll, we'll give you a link. Julie uh, Hendrickson up in Cloquet will post a link about 15 minutes before the end of the hour um, to the online continuing education form. Um, we need you to fill that out. In fact, that form will close 30 minutes after the end of the talk. So we've been asked by Society of American Foresters and ISA to really kind of tighten down um, uh, who's eligible for credits. And, and one way we do that is we look at server records plus your sign-in records. Uh, but I wanted to mention that you need to, you need to fill out that form more or less immediately. So if you're at your own computer watching alone, just do it when we post the link or just after the end. If you are in someone else's office, um, just go to your office and post the link. It's a short URL that we'll give you. If you're in a broadcast site, you don't have to do anything with an online form, but you do have to fill in the sign-in sheet. Those of you in St. Paul, um, I'm going to run upstairs and get the sign-in sheets afterwards if you're interested in credits. So don't leave without doing that. So again, uh, welcome. Minnesota phenology. I'm going to talk about four things. I will try to wrap us up here uh, within the hour, although the, the last section here is kind of optional, and so you may choose to stick around for the step-by-step -step how to observe online uh, through Nature's Notebook, or, or you may choose to leave, whether you're online or in person. But I'm going to talk about what is phenology. Many of you probably have a basic idea of that. Um, some of you may have a lot of experience and knowledge about it. Why does it matter? So I mentioned we've had a lot of interest in this topic, and, and there are a number of reasons why. I'm going to talk about some of those. Um, how and what to observe. I'm not going to tell you what you should observe. Each of you may have different reasons for observing phenology, but um, I'll give you some guidelines, and I'm going to suggest a set of protocols and a, and a procedure uh, that you may choose to use, which, which we recommend and we think is, is a good idea. That has kind of two components. One component is what you observe. And I'm going to pass along information about seven focus species that we've identified here in Minnesota. Um, so we'd love to have folks observing those seven species. But I'm also going to talk about um, things like specific protocols. So if, if, if you and I are both monitoring bur oaks, um, but I think that uh, uh, when a tree has any green on it at all, it has leaves, but you think leaves are not, you say, no, it doesn't have leaves yet until they're fully formed. That's just one example. If we're, if we're defining terms differently, we're going to get different data that don't really reflect reality. So there's a good, very good set of protocols developed by the folks at the National Phenology Network. I'm going to talk about those. That's kind of the second component of how to observe. And then, as I said, we'll close with kind of an optional um, set of slides about how, kind of the technical how-tos about observing through the Nature's Notebook online um, and kind of smartphone application. So that's the, the outline for today. Um, and I'll remind folks, too, to please um, go ahead and submit questions at any time. I can't see the chat pod right now, but Noah is going to be, I'll be pausing a couple of times throughout, and Noah will um, forward any questions to me. So don't wait for a pause. Um, just type those in any time. And those of you in the room, same thing. Just raise your hand. Um, so what is phenology? Um, it's a very old term based on the Greek root pheno, to show or appear. You can read the definition on the screen here, but it's 
the study of recurring plant and animal uh, life stages, such as a couple of examples out of many, bud break, flowering, migration, that are influenced by environmental changes, especially seasonal variations. We think a lot about temperature, um, but when we think about, because of course it, it warms up in spring, but some species respond to temperature, some species respond almost exclusively to day length, uh, of course, a lot of species respond to soil moisture and precipitation-related uh, factors, and, and phenology kind of wraps all of these things together. It's kind of a technical term, and, and it's um, uh, received a lot of attention from researchers recently. But phenology really has been the calendar that has driven a lot of the things that we do, whether it's planting crops, uh, harvesting crops, hunting, uh, managing livestock, doing a whole variety of different things. Uh, our lives really are rooted in the calendar that nature provides for us and that surrounds us uh, throughout the season. So this really is something that people have been deeply connected to for as long as we've been around. Uh, and that plays out in a number of different ways. You probably can't read the, the words on the screen here, but this is a, a gardening calendar showing crop availability uh, for a wide variety of commonly planted and harvested species. So um, in a more modern sense, we use phenology and seasonal change to govern when we can get into the soil, when we can plant things, when we should expect to have different kinds of crops. Um, and it's, um, uh, it's also just a lot of fun. You know, when I talk about um, kind of the reasons to monitor, you know, this is a picture of a bur oak. Uh, twig taken just outside of Green Hall here on the St. Paul campus. Um, and, and I can tell you that um, just in the last couple of years since I've kind of gotten interested in this, um, it's just a great way to kind of force myself to slow down a little bit. I'm a forester. I do, um, uh, you know, I know a lot about trees, at least I think I do. Uh, but I've learned a lot about some of the things that we don't always see um, that are going on with trees um, when we begin to monitor this. So it's all around us. It's everywhere. Um, and, and it's just a matter of how and in what ways we pay attention to it. So Minnesota, um, kind of transitioning a little bit to, to why it matters, uh, Minnesota is really an ecologically unique place. I moved here about 15 years ago uh, from the east and, and feel like I'm still very much discovering um, this area. But when we look at Minnesota, many of you are familiar, but we've got these four biomes. Um, and that means we've got a lot of borders and a lot of boundaries, ecological boundaries in Minnesota. And when we see things changing, and we have had a number of changes in the observational record uh, of temperature and, and other things over recent uh, decades, uh, these are the things that govern where these boundaries are. And so if we see changes in precipitation and temperature patterns in Minnesota, uh, that is likely to lead to changes in where we find certain species, um, how healthy and productive different um, tree and forest types uh, are, and so on. So being right near all of these borders, we're likely to see a lot more changes than someone might see, for instance, 300 miles northeast of us uh, in northern Ontario. So this is an issue that really matters here in Minnesota. And I mentioned before changes in the observational record. I, I'm not going to really talk about climate models today at all. Um, I have one slide showing something about it. But basically, when we look back, what we see uh, is we've observed uh, temperature records that, that really have changed quite a bit. So this figure, I, I hope, is high enough resolution for folks to see. Uh, shows the uh, statewide annual temperature history going back to uh, the late 19th century. And the, the, the red and blue sections are the five-year running average, so just a smoother depiction of the dot uh, and, and, and sharper lines. And when we look at this, we can see that there's um, clearly a trend of temperatures rising uh, within the last 25 or 30 years, beginning in the late 70s and early 80s. But there's more to it than that if we zoom in a little bit, so to speak, to the, the seasons. When we begin to look at um, meteorological winter, spring, summer, and fall, the, the letters uh, are the, the first letter of each month's name, December, January, February, March, April, May, and so on. We can see that the temperature changes are not evenly distributed throughout the year. 
Uh, much more of the warming that we've seen has happened in winter. We're seeing fewer very cold uh, winters. Uh, we're seeing uh, slightly warmer springs, and there's really not too much of a difference in summer and fall. Um, why does this matter? Well, it, it uh, matters a lot. We all heard a lot about the polar vortex and, and what impact it might or might not have on emerald ash borer. There was a lot of discussion, you know, are these uh, 30 degree below temperatures and 40 degree below temperatures going to wipe out the EAB? Um, and maybe so, maybe not, maybe some. It seems from what I've heard that a lot of them have been knocked back, but um, they're not gone. Um, and so that's emerald ash borer, but in a broader sense, winter really regulates distribution of a lot of species beyond emerald ash borer. And so where we see milder winters, um, that, that may be something we really want to know more about and something we need to know how it's going to affect uh, the species that we're concerned about. So uh, how do these play out? I talked earlier about seasonal calendars and how we run our lives based on what we see. Um, looking at warmer winters, you know, we see changes in maple syrup production. We had a great year last year, a pretty good year this year, some down years before that. But as things continue to change, some of this might change as well. Some of you may be familiar with the uh, uh, climate change uh, tree atlas uh, produced by the Forest Service. There's a link there that's not a live link, uh, unfortunately, for those of you watching online. But you can, you can Google that or, or write down the URL. Um, but this, uh, and I, I'm not going much into this at all, but if you look basically at the models, you can see a pretty consistent trend in the projections across a wide range of species uh, where uh, ranges, tree species ranges, are very likely to shift northward and eastward. So I talked earlier about biome boundaries. Um, that is borne out uh, by the data that we, uh, that we see when we look at these models. Uh, and so we, we are expecting to see uh, changes in where we find tree species. Uh, in the meantime, between now and then, um, we, we may see, through changing uh, temperature and precipitation patterns, differential effects on different species. We hear about biological asynchronies where uh, birds are returning based on photo period, but insects are hatching, insects being food sources are hatching at a different, uh, at a time frame that, that's changed because they're more dependent on temperature, for instance. Um, and so as we look at how these things are changing, tree distribution, the timing of their seasonal activities, um, we are likely to see some impacts. Uh, I guess I have two slides showing projections. This is the second one. You know, looking to the future, we do see, we do expect to see uh, differential effects, as I said before, on um, different seasons. So we expect our summers, uh, based on this one report from the Union of Concerned Scientists, uh, summers to be more like what we see in uh, 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 Oklahoma and uh, that region, uh, Kansas and Nebraska, uh, winters to be more like what we see in southern Wisconsin. Again, um, not all species are going to be affected in the same way. These projections may or may not be completely accurate, but looking at a wide variety of data sources, we see pretty consistent indications of, of what we might expect in the future. So why do we need phenology data? I've been getting at this to some degree, but climate models um, can be really hard to understand. It can be hard to know how accurate climate models are. We need them in a whole variety of ways because without them it's hard to know where we're going. And on the other hand, for a lot of the population, climate models um, seem really foreign. They're, they're, they're distant, they're hard to understand, they're just plain mathematically complex. Uh, people, I think, have very valid concerns about, gee, if we can't predict the weather tomorrow, how can we predict the climate in 100 years? Um, and, and they're notoriously hard to localize or downscale. So we can look at these very big, general, broad-scale trends, but if a landowner wants to know, well, what tree should I plant? How is this going to affect my county or my land? it's extremely hard to, to be confident in the, the results we get from downscaling um, climate models. Uh, on the other hand, we trust data that we understand. We trust data that whether or not we collected it individually, we know someone just like us did, someone from our town did, and so on. Phenological changes are directly observable. 
if that I showed you the picture of the bur oak leafing out before, we all know what that means. Again, we might have slightly different ideas of what constitute full, full leaf development or whatever, but this is simple stuff. It's not a mathematical model. Uh, and finally, and it's not on here, but um, why does climate change matter? Um, you know, temperatures are just numbers. What matters is how they're going to affect us. And, 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 and what we need to know is not just what's the temperature, what's the annual average temperature or whatever, we need to know locally and in a specific way what's going to change and what do we need to do about it. And these phenology data can tell us at a very high level of resolution, both geographically uh, and also in terms of the, the species that matter to us, the ones that we're observing, um, what is and is not changing. We don't expect everything to change. Um, I'm going to pause here now. I can see I'm about 15 or 16 minutes in. Do we have any questions posted? Okay, no questions posted yet. If you do have questions, feel free to type them into the chat pod. Uh, or uh, if you're at a broadcast site, I guess raise your hand uh, and let us know. I think I'm going to keep going. Noah, why don't you, if questions do come in, mm -hmm. give me a sign and I'll, I'll pause. So I mentioned before the um, increasing interest uh, among researchers in phenology. If you look at the number of published papers every year, uh, it's gone up exponentially uh, in the last couple of decades. Uh, phenology is increasingly recognized as a, something really worth looking at. Uh, there are a number of famous uh, scientists that have gotten involved in this. The uh, uh, most best known to, to some uh, is Aldo Leopold, who is a famous phenologist. You can see his um, shack here uh, in uh, the Baraboo, Wisconsin area, shown on the right side of the slide. And interestingly, his daughter, Nina Leopold Bradley, really picked up where he left off uh, and helped to create a really long and, and useful phenology record. Um, I'll show you that in a minute, but before we go into that one, um, I'm going to switch over to the chat pod again because I'm going to ask you guys a question. What is he, I wonder if anyone knows um, the longest phenological record of flowering. Um, those of you in St. Paul, the mic will pick you up. So if you know the answer, say it quietly so you don't give it away to everyone. Anyone know? Well, I think about it. I do have one question from Grand Rapids. Okay. Uh, do you know of any way models or programs that calculate growing degree days? Oh, there are all kinds of models. Yeah, there are models based on, um, you know, depending on what you're looking at, there are, there are a whole wide variety of models that, that um, are based on degree days. Uh, degree days are a measure of um, temperature above a certain threshold defined by the model um, uh, times the number of days uh, that, that reach that threshold. So uh, it can be a really important indicator for those species that respond primarily to temperature change. Degree day models are really useful. Um, I'm not going to get into specific models, but if there's a question about, uh, about that that someone wants to follow up on, I'd be happy to, to take it. Noah, any guesses online for the longest uh, phenological record of flowering? Not yet. Any guesses here? No? All right. Well, geez. Uh, cherry blossoms in Japan. We have about 850, well, it started in 850 AD. So we have an incredibly long record of the phenology of cherry blossoms in Japan. And you can see, if, if you can read it, on the left side of the slide here, uh, shows the date in each of those years from 850 AD that the cherry blossoms were um, recorded as, as being in flower uh, going back to 850 AD. So it goes up a lot, it goes down a lot, uh, and the, the biggest kind of departure from the mean during that period has occurred in the last um, several decades uh, here. So we have seen changes in this record uh, as well as some others. But taking it a little bit closer to home, those of you familiar with the St. Paul campus know Hodson Hall. Uh, Alec Hodson uh, was a phenologist here locally. He would walk from, I understand, from his house to his office, and, and, and he would record each year the date of aspen leaf emergence uh, along the way. And he did that from about 1940 until the early 90s. Um, uh, at that point, the early 90s, Chris Biarski picked up. Now, Chris's data uh, refers to the same species in the same phenophase. I'll talk about phenophases later, the phenophase in this case being leaf bud break uh, in Aspen. Uh, but Chris's data are from East Bethel, 
uh, Cedar Creek um, Ecological Station north of the Twin Cities. Uh, but you can see over that period, 1940 to 2010, about a 50-year period with a bit of a gap, uh, there is a distinct change observable in that record of the, the date of uh, aspen leaf bud break. Uh, declining, meaning it's happening earlier now than it did then. I don't know if he's in the Grand Rapids Forest History Center uh, or not today, but uh, John Latimer is well known to many people in northern Minnesota. He appears on KAXE radio uh, and with the, the Phenology Show every Tuesday morning. Uh, John, while driving his mail route, um, for 30 years until we retired a, a few weeks ago, uh, would record phenological observations along his 100-mile mail route north of Grand Rapids. John also has a record of aspen leaf bud break, and if you look at it from about 1984-85 up through 2014, uh, I, I guess it ends actually in 2013, um, you can see kind of a similar pattern. And if we overlay the two of those, now, as you'd expect, John's, John's data um, found that Aspen was breaking bud later, because his data are from Grand Rapids and not the Twin Cities, uh, but the pattern is essentially similar. So bringing it closer to home, we might draw a conclusion from this that, that we have observed earlier leaf bud break in Aspen uh, over the last 60 or so years. I mentioned Nina Leopold Bradley a little bit earlier. Uh, these data are from a uh, publication of hers back in 1999, and all the details, again, may be a little bit tough to read depending on your screen resolution, but the, the key point here is that not everything is responding in the same way. So if we look at uh, the, the, the figures on the left side here under the, the responders heading, we can see Eastern Phoebe first and then moving down, Rose-Breasted Grosbeak, uh, uh, both of those, the, the phenophase is, is arrival after the spring migration. Um, forest flocks blooming and then Baptisia blooming. Looking first at Aldo Leopold's data back in the 40s uh, and then looking at um, uh, the more recent data collected by Nina Leopold Bradley, um, we see that there's a clear response in the timing of those species return or flowering. Uh, but many other species are not responding. Um, from the same data set, fox sparrow arrival, eastern towhee arrival, slender penstemon blooming, and St. John's wort blooming, there's essentially no change. And in fact, in one or two of those cases, there may be just a slight um, increase or, or you know, the towhees may be arriving a little bit later. So um, as I said before, what matters to us really is not the temperature. What matters is the changes induced by that changing temperature and precipitation. And, and the reason we need high resolution data, data that are specific, literally, to species, um, is that not everything responds in the same way. Eli, a question? Uh, yeah, question, go ahead. Um, back on the last slide, do you know uh, both um, Chris's data and this data here, what your, when you look at your averages there, or your, your line, and then you look at the dots, and, and your, I guess my question is, how many years are they, intervals, are they actually used to determine the average? Is it Because there's quite a variety of up and down in there. And so the question that I have, even looking at the straight lines, is there's a lot of variance that you can see. So what, what determines the number of years in terms of average in order to get that line that well, you can, you can fit a line. So the, the question, in case it was not audible to, to folks in other places, uh, was, um, look, there's a lot of variation from year to year, both um, in the early data set on the left of each of these figures, and then again in the, the more recent data set. So how, how many years are figured into the averages? Um, without getting too deep into the statistics, I mean, you can fit a line between any two dots. What matters um, is the quality of the fit of that line. Um, I don't know that there's a certain number of years required here. Um, the statistical um, significance of the relationship of the decline or the lack of change um, is going to depend on the number of data points and how, how well the line fits those data points. So the more data you have, um, the more um, confident you can be in your result. And in this case, um, there clearly is a relationship. I mean, if we just think here in Minnesota, two winters ago and a couple of winters before that, we had a number of mild winters 
Um, not a lot of snow, not the best skiing, depending on where you are. And the last two have just been doozies. Um, at least we've had uh, we had a bit of a late start to winter last year, uh, but the winter that just ended um, uh, uh, just kind of kept going. So there's a lot of variation from year to year. There always has been and always will be. Um, but the, if we have long-term records, we can begin to tease out kind of the signal from the noise um, on figures like this. Is it? Can I ask? Is it a regression line and not an average? Seems to me. I'm yeah, sure. yeah. It's not. A, it's not an average. I mean, there are a variety yes. of ways that you, you can look at average. data like this. Oh, I used the word average. Yes. Oh, well, sorry if I was misleading. I no. It's a. It's a regression line um, fit to the data here. Yeah. We have a comment online from Grand Rapids. Okay. We would like to go back to the slide with aspen breaking bud. It seems more appropriate to align aspen breaking bud with growing degree days rather than calendars. Uh, okay, that's a good point. Um, so what what we now I, I don't know honestly. So we've we've just been looking at a slide that shows that some species are responding more than others, um, and and we know from studies of plant physiology and, and animal um, behavior and migration patterns, the different species um, phenophases are triggered by different kinds of things. So that's a very good point. I, I, I think, I, again, I'm not sure, but I think aspen, certainly seems logical that aspen would respond primarily to a degree day type model. So if it warms up earlier in the spring, you might expect aspen to leaf out sooner. So if indeed that's the case, um, you can look at this and you might conclude, and we saw earlier some temperature records showing us milder winters and milder springs, warmer springs. So what's causing, the, the, I think the question from Grand Rapids really gets to what's causing the trend that we see here. And um, it would make logical sense to think that the trend in earlier bud break in Aspen would be caused by, or at least associated with, the temperature trend that we discussed earlier. So indeed, there may be um, degree day changes. Um, degree days may be accumulating earlier in the spring on average now than they did 50 years ago when Alec Hodson began this data set. Um, now, Aspen may not respond primarily to degree days. There, there may, you know, different, again, different species respond to different things. Um, but certainly, that would be suggested here. We need to test um, in different ways than simple observation in order to understand what exactly is driving the change in aspen leaf date. But um, the, the, the degree day model certainly seems plausible to me. So I'm going to keep moving. Uh, this is a picture from the Be Forewarmed uh, research site up at the Cloquet Forestry Center. This is a site, really interesting, large-scale um, research uh, project based here at the University of Minnesota looking at the effect of artificial warming on uh, phenology, essentially. Uh, so what they do is they have these arrays set up out in the woods, and they are uh, warming the soil and taking a whole variety of measurements to look at how that warming affects uh, phenological development. Um, now, they have these things set up first, well, in two places, you know, out in the open without a tree canopy over, overhead, and then the other is under an enclosed canopy. So if you look on the left side of each of these next series of slides, you see um, pictures from the open canopy condition. On the right side, you see uh, pictures from the closed canopy. Um, so if we look, oh, and, and ambient temperature is no treatment at all, no artificial warming, just ambient, what's happening naturally. Plus 3.6 is the situation that's where they take the ambient temperature and then increase it by 3.6 degrees Celsius. So looking from top to bottom, we see that the warm sites, looking at red oak, uh, are leading to um, a fair bit uh, earlier leaf bud break than the ambient temperature sites for both open and closed canopy. There's not too great a difference between open and closed canopy, but there's a pronounced difference between ambient and warm. Now we're going to go a week into the future. May 11th, 2010, you can see that this pattern continues. The uh, artificially warmed uh, red oaks are much further along in their development. You can see normal leaves, uh, not fully developed, but you can see the shape of the leaf uh, where the others are just still breaking bud. 
One more week into the future, again that pattern persists. We've got almost fully developed leaves in the artificially warmed sites um, and uh, just still very early, small, you know, wrinkly leaves uh, in the ambient untreated sites. So this certainly is consistent with the degree day model as the questioner from Grand Rapids uh, suggested earlier. So if you look at that data, um, you, you can see that not only is the growing season starting earlier in the artificially warmed plots, it's also extending later into the fall. So these are all Latin names. The first is paper birch, Betula papyrifera. Uh, in the ambient site, which is shown in blue, you, you can see how long the growing season is. Uh, artificial warming extends that growing season at both ends. Uh, same is true of all the other species that we see here to varying degrees. Um, uh, trembling aspen, red maple, um, sugar maple, uh, bur oak, and red oak. I'll pause again for questions. That kind of concludes the second section of the presentation about kind of why this stuff matters. Um, oh, any questions here in St. Paul? Nothing online. Hey. Wow. All right, well, keep, keep, uh, don't be shy. If you do have questions, we'll, we'll get to them when we can. But I'm going to keep moving. So the next section is about what, what do people record and how to record phenology. Um, there are great records on lake ice out, uh, ice formation and ice out. Uh, people tend to monitor all kinds of things. We, we tend to monitor what we care about. We measure the things that matter to us and that are easily observed and easily measured. Um, and, and we measure in a variety of different ways as well. There are all kinds of people who have uh, notebooks like the ones you see here. Lots of people use the Minnesota Weather Guide calendar uh, produced by uh, the Freshwater Society and Jim Gilbert. Uh, lots of people record online uh, or just on their own spreadsheets whether or not they share their data online. Uh, there are all kinds of stories when you begin uh, talking to people about phenology. Stories about uh, somebody's grandfather used to write the date of corn planting on the corn crib and they did that for 40 or 50 years and then the corn crib got torn down and it was gone, you know, or whatever. So people record uh, what's important to them and they record it in a variety of different ways. I always show this and I just love it. It's the classic, um, to me, just classic phenology. This is a couple of pages from Larry Weber's phenology notebook. Again, many of you may be familiar with Larry. He was um, until recently a teacher at Marshall School uh, just at the top of the hill in Duluth and frequently appeared on, uh, I think still does, on KUMD radio. Uh, his process is that he writes one page a day, no more, no less. Uh, uh, that's what he does. He's got all kinds of codes on here. You can see that the, the pages are all numbered. Uh, these are days 24,635 and 24,636. Uh, he didn't start this yesterday. He's been at it for a while. Uh, he also, uh, in this same notebook, you know, tracks firsts and lasts of a variety of species. So um, you know, this is his way. And and, and when you think about this and you think about the variety of different people who all come up with their own ways, we end up with a number of challenges. Now, these are not all bad, but, but different people monitor different things and they record it in different ways. And, and, and uh, they, they may have different definitions of what constitutes uh, a certain phenophase. Uh, different criteria for observations, a lack of a common standard. Uh, a good thing is that we often, in records like this, get all kinds of contextual information. Information about what was going on in the mind of the observer, what was going on in terms of recent precipitation, gee, it was colder than normal today, or this whole winter has been abnormal because of XYZ. We often get this kind of uh, contextual information, which really can be valuable for analysis. But uh, we also have a real challenge of trying to extract data. I mean, you can't run this through your computer very easily. Uh, and so um, uh, there are both positives and negatives associated with this kind of approach. We have a question uh, from Grand Rapids. What about genetic variation? There's a lot of variability in Quercus rubra? Yeah, red oak. Yeah, yeah. There, that's a really interesting question. Just like there's variation from year to year, 
there's also variation from place to place and not, not just at a large scale, meaning from county to county. Of course, we'd expect Grand Rapids to see lighter leaf bud break in a certain species than St. Paul. Uh, there's also variation uh, from uh, one side of a hill to the other. There's variation from uh, a really dry site here to a really wet site a few hundred feet away. And as the questioner points out, there's variation between individuals of the same species. Uh, we can see that actually it's kind of still now as the aspens are leafing out. It's really easy to see, and not just the aspens, but other species too. With aspens, you can see where one clone ends and the next clone begins because leaves are at different stages of development and different colors. Um, so there certainly is genetic variation. Now, for those of you who choose to stick around for the kind of how-to bit at the end about how to observe in nature's notebook, the, the protocols and the standards that we're recommending that people follow involve picking one individual, one tree, a specific one that you observe every day, or when, you may not do it every day, but every time you observe, you're looking at that, spe that one. So if you have 40 acres of aspen in your backyard, you pick one. You might pick two or three or four, that's fine. The point is that when you're reporting on one species, you're, or one, one individual, you're comparing that individual tree now with its, that same tree's development at other times. So you, don't, you wouldn't just say under, under this approach, aspens are, aspen leaf, uh, or aspens are leafing out now. You would say this aspen is leafing out now. That one over there, maybe not yet. And you do see variation literally right outside of Green Hall where I generally observe. Um, I observe two bur oaks, one big old one, one young small one, uh, and they're different. They're about three or four days out of sequence. Uh, and, and so there are differences between individuals and this approach is grounded in, in noticing and detecting those. So on the one hand, we, we, we have this, Larry Weber's notebook. On the other, we have a, a, a digital approach. Um, and, and the approach that we have really endorsed and are recommending is the one adopted by the National Phenology Network. It's called Nature's Notebook. And I'm going to talk just a little bit about this approach. So at the other end of the kind of spectrum is structured reporting in a database. Again, whether or not, whether you keep your data private just to yourself or whether you share it online, uh, this is a very different kind of approach. Um, when you do this, typically you end up with observations on fewer species, but more people tracking and observing the same thing. So where if we all designed our own systems individually, we might end up recording a lot of different things because I thought of it differently from the way that other people did. Uh, but this kind of system is going to really um, encourage folks to use standard criteria, standard protocols, same criteria for observations. When we do this, we often end up with a lot of numbers. And numbers are great. Numbers are really nice. You can graph them, you can run regression, you can calculate averages, you can compare them with other places. Um, so uh, the analytical value of these data stored digitally can be much higher. Uh, but you do lack a personalized touch to observing. You're a little bit more constrained in, in how you have to do it. Um, and, and there's a little bit of a downside there. There's a bit less flexibility uh, to this approach. So I'm going to talk a little bit about phenophases now. I've used this term a few times throughout the talk, and I'm going to finally define it. Um, a phenophase is an observable stage or phase in the animal, annual life cycle of a plant or animal that can be defined by a start and end point. Now, they vary, but each phenophase generally lasts uh, not too long, a few days or weeks. So if you think about it, phenophases, um, there are all kinds of different phenophases you can look at and, or think about. Uh, if you're talking about animals, it might be um, uh, emergence from hibernation, it might be return after migration, it might be calling, if it's frogs or birds, it might be egg laying uh, in plants, uh, of course, uh, leaf out, green up, uh, flowering, seed development, seed ripening and drop, uh, and, and a variety of other things. Um, it's a little bit harder online, at least when I can't see the chat pod. But if you look at this picture, this is a, um, anyone know what this is here in St. Paul? If you're not in St. Paul, you can guess too. I'll be impressed if anyone gets it. No guesses? This is box elder. 
Uh, obviously very early in its development uh, this spring. Um, and uh, you can see two phenophases um, uh, on this slide. Um, you can see flower emergence just beginning. Those, will, those are not the complete flowers of box elder. They're, those are the staminate flowers, which about a week after this would be hanging an inch or more down. Um, uh, and you can see leaf bud break. Now, leaf, the leaf bud break phenophase, um, I've said many times, might mean something different to different observers if we all came up with it on our own. But if we look at the Nature's Notebook um, definition, um, we see that it has a very specific meaning. So breaking leaf buds means that one or more breaking leaf buds are visible on the plant. Okay, well, a leaf bud is considered breaking once a green leaf tip is visible at the end of the bud, but before the first leaf from the bud has unfolded to expose the leaf stalk or petiole or leaf base. So if we look at this, it's, it's pretty small, I know. But um, what do you all think? Is, are we seeing leaf bud break? Would we say yes or no to this phenophase on the picture that you see there? Yeah, I see a couple of people nodding. Yeah, so it, it's a little hard. Again, it's hard to see. But um, if you look at the terminal bud, that, that's clearly um, those, those are, um, I can say this because I've seen a higher resolution picture, um, those are uh, greenish yellow leaf tips coming out of the um, end of the bud. Now I'll talk more about this later, but after you say yes or no to each phenophase, then you're prompted to enter um, a level or an intensity measure. So again, remember we're looking at one individual tree. We're not looking at a stand of 40 acres or three trees next to each other. We're looking at one tree. So then the question is, how many buds are breaking? Is it less than 3, 3 to 10, 11 to 100? It's basically go by orders of magnitude, 100 to 1,000, 1,000 to 10,000, and so on. Now, obviously, it gets a little hard. To, who knows if it's 980 or 1,002? You make your best guess. Um, and over time, your observations uh, on that same individual will produce a pretty clearly evident pattern in the phenological development. You can look, I'm not going to go into all of these, but leaves, uh, the leaf phenophase starts when um, the entire length of the leaf has emerged from the breaking bud so that you can see where the petiole attaches to the stem. So you might be able to see 98% of the leaf, but if you can't see where the petiole attaches to the stem, then it's still a breaking leaf bud. It's not, you know, that, that tree is not in the phenophase uh, of having fully developed leaves yet. So again, clear definitions. You might think, well, come on, that's crazy. Why didn't they define it this other way? Well, um, they didn't. Um, there, there are reasons behind the way that these are defined. Uh, and, and, and a real uh, benefit to this approach is that we're all defining it the same way, um, which hopefully is logical and easy to remember. So we end up then with um, a typical series of phenophases for each species. And I'm, again, I'm sorry that the text is a little bit small here, but this is uh, a, 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 a screenshot of a data sheet that you can uh, download from the National Phenology Network showing the phenophases for, whoops, for uh, trees and shrubs. So the phenophases listed here, if you can't read them, they're breaking leaf buds, leaves, Increasing leaf size, that's a measure of, the, they just want to know uh, when the leaves have fully, you know, reached their full mature size. Colored leaves, falling leaves, flowers or flower buds, open flowers, pollen release, fruits, ripe fruits, and then recent fruit or seed drops. So those are the typical phenophases for deciduous trees and shrubs. So I'm going to go through uh, a couple of slides here, and I'm going to move reasonably quickly. But I, I, I mentioned earlier, I'm just going to pause for a minute here, um, how much fun I've had personally just photographing this. I've taken most of these pictures with my phone when I'm walking into the building or walking in my yard or whatever. And it's just beautiful. I mean, the color that, that you can pick up in these tiny little flowers, this is silver maple, um, is just really something when you, when you slow down and, and look closely at it. So 
Um, what phenophases, I'm not just showing you these because they're pretty, so what phenophases can we see here? Based on our definition, remember we breaking leaf buds, are, we, we know we're in the breaking leaf bud phenophase if we can see green leaf tips coming out of the end of the bud. Um, so that's a yes, right? What about leaves? Do we see, would we say that we're in the leaf phase? I know it's a little hard. You can't hold the thing or turn it or manipulate it, but what do you think? Uh, are we seeing, would you say yes to leaves or not? No, because remember, in order to have leaves, we have to see where the petiole attaches to the, uh, the main stem, and we can't in this case. Uh, we certainly do see flower development uh, right now as well. Uh, moving from silver maple to American elm, another picture taken on campus here. Uh, certainly we have flower development here on American elm, and you can see um, an expanding leaf bud at the terminus, but um, we would not say that this is in the leaf bud break phase because we can't see green leaf tips at the tip. So again, um, very specific definitions here to guide what we observe. Now I'm going to go through, these pictures are all taken just right outside of Green Hall. I'm going to go through a sequence here of Burr Oak leaf bud breaks starting April 11th of this year. Pretty tightly closed April 11th. A couple weeks later, April 23rd, we can see uh, certainly we can see some green coming out of these uh, buds. Uh, going further, uh, we can see this is now three or four days later. Uh, we can see, uh, again, continued expansion. And at this stage, being pretty naive to what Burr Oak, how Burr Oak develops, I'm thinking, okay, am I, are these breaking leaf buds or not? They're kind of breaking. I can see new tissue coming out. It's not really very green, but eh, maybe. Keep going, you'll see why I mentioned that. Uh, those are, what I was seeing emerging from those buds was actually the um, uh, uh, pollen structures, the staminate flowers. And you can see on this one now, no, I don't know if you can do the pointer on, on your screen, but the these are not the leaves up here. The leaves are emerging down below. So at this stage now, we do have green leaf tips emerging. We don't have leaves, but we have green leaf tips emerging and we would also say that we have uh, breaking flower buds in this case as well. Um, so when was I there? Uh, May 6th, now we're a week later, May 12th, and now we have leaves. We can see where the um, petioles are attaching to the main stem, and those little things that we were looking at before, the, the staminate flowers, the male uh, flowers on bur oak, you can see now are uh, much more, much closer to fully developed in this stage. So again, just a sequence showing, you know, you can look at it, but now having these phenophases, we, we begin to think about this in a slightly different way. So what you measure and how you record it and how you do or don't share it really depends on your own motivations and goals. As I said, I've had a, just a great time um, just plain slowing down and stopping for a minute or two every day and looking carefully as I enter the, the building here looking at what I'm seeing uh, on these trees. Um, I love that. I've learned a lot. I didn't know much about tree flowers and how these things leaf out. Um, it's great. Um, I do also um, report my data on Nature's Notebook because I'm, I'm also interested in the data set. Um, for all the reasons I mentioned earlier, um, there's a real, just a tremendous value to this data set collected in a specific and, and um, standardized way across not only Minnesota but across um, the country and the world um, that can enable scientists and researchers better insights into what is and is not changing. We saw Nina Leopold Bradley's data uh, showing that some species are responding and some are not, but that's only a few species. Uh, and, and we really, I, I want to be able to contribute to this data set so that we can look at a lot more species um, and understand what is and is not happening. But as I said before too, recording in this way um, leads to kind of less, you know, more, hopefully a lot more people recording data, uh, but maybe data on, on, on fewer species. And in fact, we're really encouraging folks to focus in on seven species. Um, you can see these here and you can also find all of this online um, in the URL that I um, 
uh, had, uh, I think I put it in earlier, uh, I'm just writing it down and I'm going to give this to NOAA. You can find all of this information on the URL, it's z.umn.edu slash phenology, NOAA will put it in the chat pod. And I'll come back to these species briefly again. So how did we come up with these? Um, we uh, got a number of people together. You can see um, some, some, maybe some familiar faces for some of you. Stephen Carlson, who's with Extension here in St. Paul. John Latimer has his back to the camera. Jan Green and Jerry Nemi from the Duluth area. Uh, Jerry's with UMD. Jan's a well-known birder. Um, and a variety of other people. Chris Biarski and Rebecca Montgomery are also there. So we, these are all people who have been doing phenology forever. Some of these folks have expertise in butterflies or birds or trees. Uh, we've got a couple of researchers, a couple of, um, you know, most of these people are just people who develop this habit and then never let it go and just keep doing it year after year, leading to these just fantastic data sets. So we talked about how would we select seven species. You know, if, if we want to narrow the field down so it's just not overwhelming, where can we get the biggest bang for our buck? And we thought about criteria like species that people care about. The loon is a really iconic Minnesota species. Tamarack, the next one over. Tamarack is a, calibration, a regional calibration species by National Phenology Network. So Tamarack is not that widely distributed. It doesn't even go all the way down to the southern border of Minnesota, but it tells us a lot when we look at it across a very large area. Um, about the phenology regionally. Ruby-throated hummingbird can be a tough one to observe, but it's another species that's popular and because of its habits, and I can't tell you the details of why, it was one that the bird folks thought was really a valuable one to include. Uh, monarch butterflies, another uh, iconic and very widely observed species in classrooms and elsewhere. Common lilac is not even native, but it's one of the real focal species, calibration species by National Phenology Network, um, and it's in everybody's yard. Uh, Eastern bluebird and red maple rounded out the list. So to kind of tie things together, um, and I'm not quite done yet, but um, I'm close, uh, there are a whole lot of benefits of careful observation. So we, we can compare phenology data to climate model data um, for a whole lot of reasons, it can be um, easier to just understand and make sense of and, and trust phenology data. It gives us much higher resolution and, and better insight into what is and is not changing. Not everything is changing. Um, and, you know, we talk about climate change. It's, it's not all moving uniformly in one direction. We need these data to tell us what is and is not happening. Uh, we need local, reliable data. Every system is different. One side of the hill can behave very differently from the other, uh, as I said before. And we're really looking for folks. I want to really encourage folks who are, if you're doing your own observation now or if you're thinking about it, give it a try. We'd, we'd love for folks to be contributing to this Nature's Notebook database. Um, it's wonderful to have a long record. Um, but it's a whole lot better to have a record that becomes accessible to researchers uh, to, to do the kinds of analyses, some of which I've shown you earlier. And I want to make a special kind of announcement. We have uh, Rebecca Montgomery, Chris Biarski, Stephen, and I, I'm only slightly involved, but we've recently received LCCMR money, lottery money, to take some old, long data sets, phenology data sets, from notebooks of the type that I showed earlier and digitize it. Um, so we have resources to do that. So if you know of your father-in-law or whoever that's got 80 years of corn planting dates or 80 years of whatever, um, or if you've been observing, it doesn't have to be 80 years, if you've been observing especially one of those seven species for a long time, please drop us a line. Um, uh, we, we do have resources to, to work with you to get those things digitized uh, and, and we would love to hear from you. So, so please let us know um, if you're in that situation. The URL that I shared earlier to the lots more information about the seven species is now displayed here again. Uh, those of you who are watching on your own computer, you should be able just to click and, and it'll open a new window and take you there. <clears throat> 
uh, those of you attending the broadcast sites and also um, everyone else, I'll also email out this URL so you'll get it from me in the next day or two as soon as we get the recording uh, posted online. Um, but, but this is the basics. And I'm going to pause here for questions again. And then I said earlier, we've got kind of this optional um, additional section that some of you may want to stay for and some of you may not about how to actually, I'm going to talk more about what I discussed earlier, how to establish a site, how, how you select an individual tree or whatever to monitor, how to enter your data on Nature's Notebook. I do it on my phone. Um, some people may want to do this. There are some nice advantages if you're into that sort of thing. Um, but lots of people, I think the vast majority of people do it. Uh, you, know, use, you can just print out data sheets for the specific species that you use um, and, and use those and, and go back to your computer later and enter it. So I'll pause now for questions and then I'll go into that last, um, last section. Any questions? Goodness. Do you, um, before you leave, do you want, um, are you going to do continuing education credits? All right. All right. Noah, no questions online? No, at this time. My goodness. I know. All right. Well, I'm not going to waste time then. Again, type your questions in. Oh, and I hope, I can't see the chat pod, but has Julie typed in the, um, great, Many continuing times. education. Uh, I'm going to remind folks, I guess, before we moved on, uh, before we move on, I said this before, but you gotta you got to fill out that online form for continuing education credits within about a half hour. Um, that form will close. You won't be able to enter data after about 12.30 or 12.45 today. So please don't forget to do that or you won't be able to. Any questions, you can email us. You'll find our information on that form. Yeah, no. uh, one more comment. Uh, there is a note up that says the June presentation has been rescheduled. Yeah. And the next presentation on July 15th will be addressed internationally. Yeah, okay. yeah. thanks for mentioning that. We have had to reschedule a couple of talks just uh, due to uh, scheduling mix-ups. Uh, so there will not be a June uh, regularly scheduled webinar. Uh, that was to be Katie Fernholtz talking about changes in green building standards. Katie will still be presenting. We've moved her to, to mid-August. Terry Saris, who was to present in August on sedge identification, uh, will now be presenting, I think, in late July. So we, we will still be presenting all of those webinars, but some dates will change. Um, the website doesn't currently reflect those changes, but it will soon. We do have a question from Nancy. Yeah. All right. Do you have to choose an individual branch on your tree since bud break may occur at different times on the same tree? God, great question. No, no, uh, Nancy, you would, you would uh, observe for that whole individual tree. Um, so no, not just an individual branch. Now you can imagine that if you're looking at a six foot tall apple tree, it's going to be a lot easier to count or at least estimate how many leaf buds are breaking than if you're looking at a 250-year-old, you know, 110-foot-tall red pine. Um, so uh, it, it can be easier or harder in some categories. You know, you're, you're never going to have 10,000 breaking buds on a, uh, on a you know, small uh, seedling. Um, but it, it's, not, it, it's for that whole individual tree. Not the whole stand, but the whole individual tree. Um, now, it, it can be very useful to look at one individual branch as, you know, to help you uh, do some math to estimate the total number of breaking buds. We do that a lot. If you're looking at a good sized tree and, uh, I don't know, there are just hundreds, I don't know how many, you can pick one prominent branch, do a real quick rough count, and then say, okay, there are 12 other branches that are about this size and do the math. That can be a useful way to do it. But the number you report is going to be the total number of whatever on an entire um, tree. So I'm going to shift gears now uh, to how to use Nature's Notebook. Do you want me to continue to record? Yes, okay. please do continue to record. Thanks, Noah. Mm -hmm. How to use Nature's Notebook. So Nature's Notebook is the online reporting system generated by the National Phenology Network. Um, this is pretty small, but I, I, I just want to, this is a screenshot of, uh, uh, of, of the How to Observe page on Nature's Notebook. And I want to hone in on, on what we see here. So ba the basic steps are first you create a free account at Nature's Notebook. There's no charge. You set up an account. Now you, 
you don't, as I said before, you don't just say, oh, in, in Itasca County, the um, uh, bur oaks are leafing out. Uh, you're going to pick specific sites. Those of you familiar with the term, you can kind of think of these as long-term ecological research sites. They're, they're your little sites. Uh, it might be the, you know, your backyard. It might be a state park you like to visit or wherever you walk your dog. It might be any um, natural area you're going to establish a site. You'd call it my backyard, or you'd call it the lawn west of Green Hall, or you'd call it whatever you want to call it. Once you've got a site established, you're going to choose plant and animal species that you'll observe at that site. So if the site is out my kitchen window, you know, backyard or whatever, and you have bird feeders, you might record the birds that you see there. You add them to nature's notebook, uh, and then uh, you begin observing. So you would say, today I uh, I didn't, today I saw this species at the feeder or I saw um, this baroque leafing out and so on. So the point here is it's not necessarily intuitive. You might think, oh, well, you know, yeah, the, um, we're just observing in a general area that something is happening, but it's not. They, they really, you know, in order to participate in nature's notebook, in order to follow their protocols, you choose specific sites populate those sites with species that you're going to be observing, and then you literally name each individual that you're going to observe. Obviously, you don't do that with animals. You can't name the cardinal or whatever that you're going to see. Um, but with plants and trees, you name the individuals. Now, there are a few exceptions to that. There are some species that grow in patches, prairie plants and so on, um, uh, that, that you would look at a patch, and it wouldn't make sense. They may be clonal or for other reasons, it wouldn't make sense to pick one individual stem, you re report on the patch. But even for clonal species like aspen, you would report on one individual tree. <clears throat> so they've kind of made this a little bit of a game. You get badges for doing certain things. Um, uh, but what I'm going to zoom in on here again is the lower portion of the screen. You can see the sites that I've got set up uh, in that first box on the lower left. Bellwin Educational Center, BSU, that's Bemidji State, Hobson Hall. We set that one up for the Minnesota Family Woodlands Conference. Cloquet Forestry Center, Green Hall, West Lawn, and so on. If I highlight one of those sites, you can see the, the species and individuals. I'm going to zoom in now on the Green Hall, West Lawn site. You can see that, as I said before, I've got specific named individuals. I've got the borough, I mean, you can name them whatever you want. Bur oak near the main entrance, the bur oak smaller one near the white pine, eastern white pine near the sidewalk, and so on. I chose to give them descriptive names as opposed to just saying bur oak number one and bur oak number two because um, I want to remember which one's which, and I don't do a lot of, of observing on those species over the winter for obvious reason. So I, come spring, I, excuse me, I wanted to remember what it was. So now from here, I would go down to the lower right. Um, if I was entering observation data, I would click Enter Observation Data down there at the lower right. And then we end up with a page like this, Green Hall West Lawn. I'm going to enter the date and time of my observation. Uh, and then I'm going to click down below. No, I don't know if you can highlight this with your pointer there, but let's just say I'm looking at Burr Oak near main entrance right down here. If I click that, I end up with, it just expands that section and gives me a digital form of the data sheet that I saw before. So on April 29th, 2014, and, and these are the data that I showed you earlier with the pictures. Do I see breaking leaf buds? I said, yeah, I do at that point. Uh, and I, then I'm prompted for the level, 1,001 to 10,000 is what I chose, if you can see that on your screen. But it was no to all the other phenophases, at least at that time. And so you just quickly go through and, and enter your data. Now, in practice, I usually do this, as I said before, using my phone. The Nature's Notebook phone app is a little different from this. I just do it in the field. I don't need to be connected to the internet to do it. Um, it just synchronizes when I get back to a connection. But it's the same basic process. If you forget your phenophase definitions, it's been a while since you last observed or whatever, you just can mouse over it and you'll get, or, or you can get it, uh, you know, on your phone. 
um, you can get a definition of those phenophases and the intensity measures as well. So uh, this is for um, uh, uh, falling leaves, I guess. No, I'm sorry, this is for colored leaves. One or more leaves, including any that have recently fallen, have turned to their late season color. Okay, now I know what that means. Now I'm going to say yes or no to that phenophase. So just a quick review of the Nature's Notebook process, and you can get all, much more information online. Uh, NPN does an excellent job of supporting uh, observ observers by, with very good instructions. They do webinars. They do a variety of things uh, to, to help with that. And we've got links to all of that on the phenology page that I showed you earlier, and that I'll email to everyone. But again, it's not just random observations. If you, you, know, you make a trip to Yellowstone National Park, um, you're probably not going to report phenology that you saw there. Instead, you're going to focus on your sites and your species. So you establish your observation sites. You populate those sites with species. You add and name the individual species you're going to observe. And then you uh, observe and enter data repeatedly on those sites over time. <clears throat> so back to a question that was asked in Grand Rapids a little bit earlier. I don't know if that person's still with us. Um, about genetic variation. You can end up, uh, you know, if, if it just happens that, you know, we live next door to one another, we're both observing on trees of natural origin that have slightly different genetics, well, my data might be a little bit different from yours. Um, that's fine. That's not a problem. If you think about it, if we both do this for 20 years, my data on my tree might vary in a certain pattern from year to year. Your data on your tree might vary in the same pattern from year to year, and that variation from year to year might be expected to track um, with one another. The comparison between mine and yours is useful and tells us something about what's happening across the landscape, and it tells us just how variable this species is, which is important to know. Um, but the fact that there is some genetic variation is really not a problem uh, in terms of, of what you choose to observe. So now I'm really done. I'll take any, any, any questions that remain, but this is that URL again. Uh, I want to thank everyone one more time for joining us. This has been, um, it's been fun, and, uh, and I'll take any closing questions. Anything there? Not yet. Crickets online? No. All right. <laughs> well, um, uh, all right. I, I think I, I will watch the chat pod in the next few minutes, so if you're just typing slowly, um, uh, I'll, I'll watch it, so stay online, but um, probably Noah, we ought to, um, do, do you have any questions? You just gave me the thumbs up, no. Grand Rapids says, great job, Eli. Hey, hey, great. All right, thanks, <laughs> Grand Rapids. <laughs>